Um, so uh, I wanted to introduce myself first uh, to my audience. A lot of people know me, but uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Clapper knows my story. Um, but I, I lost uh, 150 pounds um, eight years ago. Uh, originally, it was um, with a mostly plant-based diet. Um, I, I was focusing on eating all the healthy foods to um, avoid um, blood pressure medication, and uh, I wanted to get healthy on my own. I became completely vegan on um, September 6, 2016, and I've never looked back. I, I feel healthy. I ran my first half marathon last year. Um, lots of energy, and I, I can't say enough good things about this diet. And uh, I just have a, a, um, some uh, plant-based questions for you um, uh, after. Uh, but uh, Terry, if you could uh, introduce yourself as well. Hi, Dr. Clapper. Um, my name is Terry Gleason. And um, I mostly like my career kind of centered around um, fitness and athletics. And I was a phys ed teacher for a little while and um, kind of got into personal training and group fitness for adults. Um, and I kind of realized that I was missing a piece of the puzzle of health and which is diet. And, um, you know, throughout all my training and, and education, diet, it was still confusing to me. So I just happened to just take the right steps at the right time. And I happened to get into this workshop that, um, that promised it wasn't selling me anything and that they were going to make nutrition easy. I was like, all right, I can deal with that. Let me see what I can learn to help my clients a little bit better. And it was evidence-based nutrition, what it was called. So it wasn't called anything with veganism or, or plant-based or anything like that. So the kind of the title got me and it just opened my eyes to what nutrition actually is and what diet can actually be for people and how people can really change their lives. Um, and I love, you know, the, the success stories of, of chronic disease reversal and weight loss, but I really wasn't in a position where I needed to really do any of that. So I was like, then why does it really matter if I do it? I'm already healthy. I'm already athletic. I'm already this. But um, I can't tell you enough how much this diet change has helped me too, just in the energy levels and just in um, just like how I feel on a daily basis. So it's, it's been really been an impact for me. And um, I just, and like love it now so it's definitely kind of taken me into more of a ethical vegan path and an environmental path and it's kind of just opened a world of all these wonderful things um simply from just a healthy diet so um thank you again for being here for us to, to speak oh, with you yes. good for, oh, it's a pleasure and good for you for following the, the truth of that path that you're on that's wonderful to hear. Mm -hmm. and dr clapper if you could uh, provide a brief introduction before the questions i know you graduated from university of illinois um uh, and uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about your background for our uh, Yes, I uh, indeed uh, graduated from the University of Illinois College of Medicine way back in the early 70s. For the first 10 years of my life, uh, of my medical career, <clears throat> excuse me, I was practicing blood and guts medicine in emergency rooms, operating rooms, urgent care clinics, uh, general practice offices. Uh, in 1981, uh, a couple of events happened uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the operating rooms at Vancouver General Hospital. I was a resident in anesthesiology, that I was going to uh, spend my life putting people to sleep. Uh, and I got the message loud and clear from watching the surgeons every day on the cardiovascular service open up people's hearts and, uh, and the arteries in their hearts and pull out this yellow greasy gut called atherosclerosis, uh, which leads to heart attacks and strokes. Uh, my dad died of clogged arteries. I knew I was going to be laying on that operating table uh, with that striker saw going up my sternum if I didn't change my diet. There were already studies in the book. This is 1981. There's already studies in the medical journals uh, about plant-based diets reversing this disease. Uh, so I adopted a plant-based diet. Um, within 12 weeks, a 20-pound spare tire of fat melted off my waist. My high blood pressure went to normal. My high cholesterol came down. I felt great waking up in a nice, light, lean body every day. Uh, and at that point, I knew I didn't want to be an anesthesiologist and spend my t life uh, putting people to sleep. I'd rather go back to general practice and help them wake up. And uh, so I did. And moved to Florida, uh, found some people to give plant-based cooking lessons to. And when I sent my overweight, diabetic, hypertensive patients uh, to these folks and they uh, adopted a plant-based diet, the changes are stunning. Uh, as was just described, within days, the obesity starts to melt away and, uh, and the arteries open up and the high blood pressure comes down and the joints stop hurting and the psoriatic skin clears up and the 
and the uh, asthmatic lungs stop wheezing so much, the migraine headaches get better. They turn into normal, healthy people uh, who don't need a bunch of pills and procedures. And when I lecture the medical students about this, I say, what more could you want as a healer to watch your patients get healthy right in front of your eyes? I'm the happiest doctor I know about my patients get healthy. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so I've been practicing plant-based medicine uh, since 1981. And as I said, it's been the most satisfying career I could possibly have imagined. And now I'm spending my time going to the medical students, medical schools, telling the students, your patients will get better if you get them on a healthy plant-based diet. You need to know this. And so uh, that's the focus. Yeah, that's an important message for sure. And uh, so that's uh, my medicine career in a, uh, in a, del- a tightly condensed yeah, delicious thank you. capsule. <laughs> yeah. thank you. So my first question, because there's, there's so much talk about um, COVID-19, obviously, with what's going on now. And I think I know your answer to this, but I want to ask anyway. Do you think a whole food plant-based diet is our best defense against COVID-19? And why is obesity a risk factor? Oh, my. Uh, Very powerful, important questions. Um, The answer, certainly the first part, is a healthy, whole food, plant-based diet. And for those of you who may not uh, be uh, aware of what we're talking about, it's a diet based on whole plant foods. Um, uh, Breakfast of oatmeal and fruit and nuts uh, with some rice milk on it, if you'd like. Uh, Lunches and dinners, big colorful salads, hearty vegetable soups, big plates of steamed vegetables, uh, whole grains, legume, uh, lentil stews and bean chilies and fruits for dessert. Uh, This is a a diet of food that grows out of the garden. That kind of diet, meal after meal, washes your cells with a load of not only water, but phytonutrients, these uh, plant-derived substances that that, that quench free radicals, that suppress inflammation, that promote tissue repair. So certainly uh, that kind of diet will spruce up your immune system, uh, which would come in handy to either repelling the virus, or if you do get the virus infection, it's, it's mild. You either have no symptoms at all, or you're achy and fluy for a couple of days and a fever, and then, then it goes away. And so a healthy immune system will help you get into that category. Um, uh, I won't guarantee you won't get it, but you, hopefully you'll do better if you do. <laughs> and uh, But also the standard Western diet full of cooked animal protein and and sugars and hydrogenated oils and preservatives and flavorings, etc. Uh, these uh, the, this kind of tide washing through your tissues every four hours after the buffalo wings and the burgers and the egg McMuffins, all of that uh, prevents your immune system. Uh, the, the oils and the sugars and the and the meat proteins uh, prevent the, uh, the the lymphocytes in your immune system from making antibodies. They they really inhibit the uh, Uh, your immune system from working like it should. And they also, that kind of food leads to, as you mentioned, obesity and the diseases that come from that. And uh, obesity is a state of inflammation. Uh, uh, In my slide presentation, I've got a, a plastic model of an obese abdomen cut lengthwise and you see the the fat surrounding the intestines, Uh, this is metabolically active. This fat puts out uh, inflammatory molecules called inflammatory cytokines that set off inflammation throughout the body. Obesity is a state of inflammation. Well, if there's this ongoing inflammation in the background of your tissue, your immune system isn't going to protect you like it should. It it is dealing with the inflammation from your diet instead, instead of the virus, if you will. Uh, And it also leads to diabetes, Um, the the fats in the diet clog up insulin receptors, so insulin doesn't work well, and so that raises blood sugars. Why is that a problem? Because if your sugar, if your tissues are saturated with sugars all day from uncontrolled diabetes, ooh, the microbes love that. Uh, Again, (laughs) your immune system doesn't work so well, and the bacteria uh, that are in uh, in our skin, our gut, et cetera, can take advantage of these sugar-soaked tissues and cause secondary infections and pneumonias and all sorts of things. Uh, uh, people who are obese, um, there's a, it's harder for the heart to pump. The blood is thicker, uh, more viscous. Uh, the arteries are more constricted. And so that puts a back pressure on the, on the heart. So uh, you get low-grade heart failure. That makes blood back up into the lungs. And if the lungs are all congested with blood and fluid, oh, the COVID virus loves, uh, that's a welcome mat for the COVID virus as well. There's a whole chain of events that come from us 
the violating natural law. If we would just eat the diet of whole plant foods that we were designed to eat, we are we're plant eating simian creatures. You can see we've got fingers on our hands, not claws. We've got right. long intestines for digesting fiber. Uh, if we would just stick to that basic plant based diet, those diseases go away and the risk from COVID goes way down. Uh, this is a a uh, message from our bodies and from the animals to stop mm -hmm. eating animals, right. eat your whole plant foods, and you'll you'll be fine, Homo sapiens. Yep. So you know, long answer, but but that's why obesity is an issue. Right, uh, Terry, you have a question? Yeah, no, and thank you for that thorough answer um, because it, it it is it's not complicated, but I think people don't want to just hear one simple answer. Like, give me all right, give me reasons why. So that was a really great um, just thorough answer. Thank you. So, um, like I said before my introduction, in my case, I, you know, it's not like I needed to reverse diabetes or um, reverse uh, obesity or any kind of chronic disease, um, and I still chose to try this whole food plant-based diet out and, and felt better. But what would you say to some people, because I know I try to have a conversation of people who are seemingly healthy, and they think that oh, moderation is fine, um, I don't really need to change, I, I'm not really sick right now, I'm, I'm seemingly healthy, I'm fine, I wake up in the morning, I go to work, I do my thing. And you know the, the word moderation is always kind of like the key defense, like moderation, with everything in moderation is fine. What would you be your take on that? Uh, like, like Dr. Greger says, uh, uh, my, would you like moderate diabetes? Yeah. Uh, how, how, about, how about a moderate <laughs> amputation? I mean, maybe just a few toes to start with. It, mm -hmm. it, you know, who are we kidding? Yeah, I mean, have a t-shirt made up saying, your body is never not looking. I mean, who are you kidding? Uh, you can't tell your body, look over here and have a cheeseburger there. You know, what was that? <laughs> you know, uh, what, I, I didn't do anything. You're, who are you kidding? Your arteries know, your liver knows, your body knows. Um, and so you put in these uh, the, the, the meat and the cheese and the dairy and the oils and the sugars, the things that we weren't really meant to be eating. And each one exerts its kind of damage uh, to its extent. And your microbiome changes as you put meat down there. Your, the, uh, the inflammation goes up. Uh, eating meat increases uh, the liver's uh, output of this hormone called uh, insulin-like insulin -like growth factor 1, IGF-1, that, that promotes cancer growth throughout the body. And people think they're getting away with something until that morning they find the lump. Uh, in the breast, or they pass that bloody stool from their colon cancer. Now, oh, how did this happen? Well, it was brewing. Uh, I had a professor in med school said, people, people don't get diseases, they earn them, you know, <laughs> meal after yep. meal after meal. And, and you think you're getting away with something, but you're not. You're, uh, uh, I'm a paleo guy, I'm, I need to meet three, eat meat three times a day. Well, your colon's got something to say about that, and your mm -hmm. microbiome got something to say about it. Your arteries got something to say about that, and uh, and then you down the road, and it takes a few years. There's a big lag time, so they think they're getting away with it, and then we see that heart attack in the 39 year old guy mm -hmm. with three kids, uh, and uh, we're seeing strokes in younger and younger people. We're seeing colon cancers in younger people. How did this happen? Uh, again, we're out of truth with our diet. So uh, mm -hmm. moderation, uh, yeah, again, uh, how, you know, how much what's a moderate arsenic intake? Uh, you mm. know, less yeah. is more and, right. and none is best. I have to say, I, I can't stand the um, analogy about moderation. So many people say it's the key. It's the one thing that drives me crazy because I know I can't live that way myself. I, I would yeah, rather... Absolutely you know, feed my body the healthy foods. Exactly, every meal matters. Uh, mm -hmm. you're, you know, within minutes of eating anything, um, molecules of that food, whether it's a, a, a ham sandwich or lentil stew, molecules of that food are flowing through every cell in your body where your DNA lies unfolded. And those food molecules wash through your cells, they wash over your DNA, and they play your DNA like a piano. And they turn genes on, they turn genes off. They induce enzymes, shut enzymes down. Every meal changes us on a genetic molecular basis. Food brings in not only nutrients, it brings in information. And we need to honor this, this reality that all the scientists are telling us now. And, and again, who, who are we kidding? Uh, every meal makes a difference. It changes us, and that opens the door to inflammation, cancers, and autoimmune.
autoimmune disease, et cetera. Uh, so how moderate do you want to be? I'm going to just, yeah. you know, cause a, a moderate amount of carcinogens to flow through my cells and a moderate amount of, uh, of aldehydes that damage my genes. Uh, at what point do you say poison is poison? Enough. I'm going to let my body mm -hmm. heal. And that's what a plant-based diet does. Exactly. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Another question I had, um, because uh, I, I do eat a whole food plant-based diet, but I'm wondering, um, with all the talk about COVID-19, how important, important are supplements? I do take DHA and um, B12, but, um, and also D3, but do you think uh, supplementation is uh, important for even people who eat clean? Right, uh, absolutely. Uh, certainly, if you're a complete plant-eating person, uh, yes, you must take some vitamin B12 a couple yeah. times a week. Uh, B12 is absolutely essential for your, your, for your viewers. Uh, it's an essential vitamin to keep your brain healthy, your spinal cord, your blood healthy. Uh, and it's made by microbes that live in the soil. And when we were eating uh, earth-connected, le leading earth-connected lives, and we were pulling roots and tubers out of the ground and eating them and drinking out of streams, uh, those same B12 producing microbes were flowing through our uh, intestinal tract, just like the deer and the antelope. Um, but uh, thanks to modern sanitation, uh, nobody's drinking out of streams, nobody's eating unwashed vegetables. And for that reason, the natural B12 sources uh, in our diet have been removed, uh, which is fine with me. I, I don't want to be treating cholera and typhoid <laughs> right. fever from contaminated water. But the, the bargain we make for that exchange is that we lost our, our natural B12 sources. So if you're a complete plant-based eater, yes, uh, our concession to modern sanitation is a couple times a week. They have something with some vitamin B12 in it. They, they grow these same microbes in big vats and extract the B12. And, um, and uh, you can just put a little tablet under your tongue once or twice a week and be done with it. So yes, that's essential. Vitamin D you mentioned, and that's important too. It's not a vitamin, it's a hormone that our, uh, that our body makes when sunlight falls on our skin. But uh, welcome to the 21st century. Nobody's outside anymore. We're all inside, especially now in this <laughs> right. COVID lockdown. Yeah. Um, but even normally, we're, we're, there's very little sunlight falling on our skin. We're so afraid of skin cancer and photo aging. Um, and well, vitamin D levels go way down. And vitamin D is important not just for calcium balance, but it's important for integrity of membranes, or for our immune system, for our, uh, for our brain function. It's involved in hundreds of different reactions in the body. Body. And uh, and I get concerned when when vitamin D levels fall too low. So um, so I too take a couple thousand international units of vitamin D every day. Uh, two thousand of units is safe pretty much for everybody. And um, so uh, those are two that I would really put up in the in the essential uh, category here. Uh, we can you know DHA uh, depends uh, who you are if you're pregnant or elderly you should probably be taking some. Uh, younger folks can probably make it on their own from their food, but that's a, that's a fine point. If you want to take some, I, I don't think it causes any, any serious harm. Um, and uh, so those are the main ones. Uh, uh, if people like to learn more about it, go to my website, drclapper.com, and I have uh, lots written about this, as well as a video called Thriving on a Plant-Based Diet, and you can, uh, you can uh, see, uh, see more about it there. But the B12 and the D are the two most important supplements that I'd recommend, especially at this time. And um, my wife is fostering four little kittens from the Humane Society. And uh, if, you hear them, if you hear them in the back, uh, she just stepped out and I think they're getting hungry. So sorry about that. Oh, I love it. Uh, oh. Show it comes by, I'll, like, I'll show it to you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to so see we, that. We were just talking about our dogs that might be interrupting in the background. So whatever. <laughs> okay. we, we're both animal lovers too. So everything Indeed. is cool. <laughs> Good. Okay, Terry. Oh. Uh -huh. Sure, yeah. Um, do you think you could shed some light on, on gluten? Um, I think there's just a lot of confusion on whether gluten is healthy. If it's not healthy, is it inflammatory? Is it not? Um, I know people, obviously, who have celiac disease need to stay away from gluten. But what about just the average Joe who doesn't really seem to have a problem? Um, should gluten be of any concern? Um, I really don't think so. Um, gluten is a, is a complex protein, but it's a chain of amino acids like all other proteins. And if you've got a healthy uh, digestive system, uh, the enzymes in your, uh, in your stomach, in your pancreas, and that line the intestine, they really have no problem cleaving the bonds in between uh, those amino acids and, and shipping them up to your liver where you're 
liver will reassemble them in, in the form of your proteins. Um, so no, the, the vast majority of people have no problem with gluten, and I don't think they need to run the other way uh, if they're eating a containing product. That said, um, I think in among 300 million Americans, there probably are a significant amount, number of folks that have a low-grade gluten intolerance. And when they do eat it, uh, they may not be aware of it, but they get bloaty and gassy and crampy and, uh, um, and they, they get, or subtle things can happen uh, as far as their skin or joints or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think there probably is a lot of undiagnosed gluten in, intolerance out there, not full-blown celiac disease. But yeah, there, there's, you know, again, 2%, 3% of the population, but if you've got it, it's an issue. So what to do? Uh, the safest thing, if, if you had suspected all that you have a gluten intolerance, and, this, and gluten is a protein found in, in wheat, rye, and barley, um, uh, don't eat it for a month. Uh, just stop all the bread, stop all of the wheat-containing pasta sauce, and just uh, give your body a break for a month, two months. Uh, and then after it's cleared out of your gut and your system, then, then have three slices of whole wheat bread one day and see what the next 48 hours brings. And uh, if you have no problem, then you've got no problem. But if you get gas and crampy or your joints hurt, your skin breaks out, and then maybe you, you, know, you probably want to find non-gluten sources for, for proteins. And there's plenty of them around. Well, thank you. Okay, and um, I had a question, because um, we were talking about DHA <laughs> earlier. And um, both Terry and I were wondering the difference between uh, DHA and omega-3. And what do you think, uh, if we do supplement with it, what is the best um, choice for a vegan for DHA? Right. Uh, DHA, docosahexaenoic acid, is a long-chain fatty acid, 22 carbon atoms long, uh, that you're, that's absolutely essential uh, for your brain health, for your core. skin membranes. Who's that down by my leg? Is that your <laughs> Let's see him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is um. We've already found a home for him, uh, but uh, uh, he, he's been claimed already. But, uh, he's oh. more of a most vocal here. Uh, <laughs> oh, adorable. So do you, do you take DHA? No, he doesn't have to because uh, right. there's DHA in animal muscle and indeed that's what these critters live on. But for us plant-eating folks, uh, we have to make our DHA uh, from... Uh, from a shorter chain omega-3 fat, linolenic acid, uh, 18 carbon atoms. Uh, that's in nuts and seeds and, and dark leafy green vegetables. And, um, and if you have an ample amount of it, and we, we should be very generous, we should have a handful of walnuts every day uh, that have linolenic acid. Uh, every morning uh, on our oatmeal, uh, we've got ground up uh, flax seeds and hemp seeds and chia seeds. We put a couple of tablespoons on that. And we really give our body plenty of this linolenic acid so we can get on turning that into the DHA uh, in our cells. Uh, and uh, so if you're not going to be taking supplemental DHA, you're, you're, you're obligated to make sure that you've got these the, the, the hemp seeds, the chia seeds, the flax seeds, and the dark leafy greens in abundance in your diet so your body can make your own DHA. If you're just not eating that uh, kind of diet, um, and, and I urge people, uh, you know, you, you got to eat whole foods here. You, you can't be a healthy plant eating person on, on granola bars and energy drinks. You got to eat the salads and the greens and the nuts and the seeds and the veggies, etc. Uh, if you do this, uh, most people have no problem. But if for any reason uh, you're just not eating greens and nuts, seeds, et cetera, uh, then it, you can make a case, and especially if you're pregnant, pregnant women really should be taking some supplemental DHA. Uh, and folks over 70, uh, uh, the body's ability to, to do this chain lengthening, turning the linolenic acid in the seeds into long chain DHA, uh, that seems to go down after age 70. Uh, so th those two folks definitely should be taking some uh, DHA. Uh, it's made by algae that live in the ocean. And, um, and so you can go to any health food store and get algae-derived DHA. You don't want it from fish. You want it from algae. Uh, this is where the fish get it. It's from algae. They swim in the ocean with their mouths open all day, swallowing algae. That's really where it comes from. Uh, so, um, so if your diet is, is, does not include nuts, seeds, greens, etc., cetera, it should. Uh, yeah, it's an invitation to healthy up your diet, and that's really should be the end of the case. But if but if you're pregnant or elderly or uh, like me, uh, or if you uh, uh, for any reason are uh, insecure about it, 
a couple times a week, I would take an algae-derived DHA capsule, around 250, 300 milligrams. Uh, but again, it, it shouldn't be necessary for healthy folks eating a whole food plant-based diet with plenty of uh, omega-3s in it already. Uh, omega-3 and DHA, are they one the same? With the yes, I'm sorry. Um, um, omega-3 uh, is, is a chemist term for these long chain fats and, um, and there's something called a double bond where there's an extra electron pair there. And in these fats, you run into that double bond and carbon atom number one, two, three is the third one in from the end. That makes it an omega-3 fatty acid. So oh, the linolenic acid in nuts and seeds, yes, it's an omega-3. Uh, we eat that. And our body adds two carbons to the end of that, turns that 18 carbon atom linolenic acid into 20 carbon atom EPA, uh, which is a which still is an omega-3. And then and then once more in the cells, it adds another two carbons, and that turns it into 22 carbon atom DHA. So the, the, these, this is all the same molecule. They're all omega-3s. There's two carbons longer, two carbons longer, two carbons see. longer. Uh, but they're all omega-3 fats, and, and they're all essential in their way. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Nice. I'm telling you're making me really uh, jealous. I didn't pay more attention in biology and <laughs> chemistry because yeah. these stuff. little buzz these little yeah. buzzwords are like I know I learned that at some point. Yeah, right. And, uh, yeah. Um, you know, it just it wasn't really of any need at that time. But now that right. I'm really interested in it, I just could listen to this stuff all day. And Good I appreciate you. your um, answer because I am pregnant right now. So I'm looking at my uh, my omega three supplement over there. I'm like, all right, good. I'm on the. I'm, I'm doing what I need to do. Good for you. Thank you good for that. Good for you, wise woman. Good luck with that. <laughs> um, so it seems like there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that a plant based diet and nutrition in general can help prevent, treat, and even reverse some chronic diseases. Um, I mean, you're one of many many doctors that I know Richard and I follow that are trying to just wake America up and the world up on this. Why? does it seem there's so much resistance in maybe the medical community and conventional doctors and I already see your <laughs> answer rolling in your head um why and when I have a, con a casual conversation with you know just an, an average friend or a family member it just seems so foreign um so what is this big big reason why it's not accepted oh my what a huge, uh, innocently phrased question. Uh, and there's many layers to this, of course. Um, uh, meat and, and meat and everything goes with it. It's a comfort food. Our, our parents give us when we're very young and, you know, and, and we're told you need protein for be big and strong. And so the whole mythology gets laid, you know, laid on us there. Uh, and the mighty hunter, he-man, red meat, uh, macho guy is, is, permeates our entire mythology from the movies to the commercials, etc. So it's, we, you know, we really believe that it's essential, even though the biology says just the opposite. The biggest, strongest, most powerful animals on the planet, elephants and buffaloes and giraffes and gorillas, grow to thousands of pounds of mammalian muscle without ever eating cheeseburgers. So, you know, all meat uh, it comes from plants. Uh, all uh, all uh, these big animals are getting it all from plants. Uh, and the doctors don't help. I'm, I'm embarrassed by my profession and, and their nutritional ignorance. They think that we practice medicine like what our patients are eating has no effect on these diseases. And I'm telling young medical students that that's why they're sitting in front of you, obese and diabetic and hypertensive and clogged up and inflamed from what they're running through their tissues every hour or every, every few hours. But the doctors don't want to hear about nutrition. Why not? Uh, they're, they're scared of it. Uh, one, they don't know anything about it. Nutrition is not taught in medical schools. Um, the, uh, it's not respected as a, as a real science like surgery and sissy stuff. Nutrition, send them to the dietitian. <laughs> they have contempt for it. And well, even though they're spending their entire careers treating nutrition-based diseases, every single one of these doctors. And third, they're eating it themselves. And uh, they don't want to stop eating their steaks and their lobsters and their burgers. So they're not going to tell their patients to eat it. And then they say, listen, I don't, not only do I not know anything about nutrition, I don't get paid for it. I don't, I don't know how to do nutritional counseling. I don't get paid for it. Why should I even bother thinking about this? And, and that's a real deficit in our whole medical uh, system. And 
but it, it keeps this juggernaut going. And of course, the, the meat industry and the, and the animal-based food industries, you know, keep this going. There's government subsidies to make uh, beef artificially cheap and pork and all of these things. Uh, there's this whole juggernaut to keep this idea going. That you, you must have meat to be healthy and steak is what's for dinner and all that. And the opposite is just true. Um, uh, the opposite is, is the, the truth of it. And uh, packing your intestines full of meat two, three times a day, as the paleo folks and the keto folks and the standard American folks do, is a recipe uh, for giving yourself colon cancer and clogged arteries and heart attacks and strokes and type 2 diabetes and dementia. And these, I think there's going to be a tsunami of these diseases. Uh, 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 plaguing us in the years to come. The, uh, now, people who adopt these plant-based diet, uh, the, the meat-based diets, they initially improve. You, know, you stop the dairy and the oil and the sugars and people lose weight and that makes their, their glucose tolerance better, uh, that helps their, their blood lipids, the weight loss. And so they say, aha, see, paleo is the way to eat, keto, ketosis is the way to eat. But as an experienced physician, I would say, listen, they're such an unnatural diet. What are you brewing up in these patients' colon walls? What are you brewing up in these patients' arteries? What are you doing to that woman's breast tissue? What is this diet doing to this guy's prostate gland? And are you going to be around in 10 years and this guy passes his first bloody stool from his colon cancer that your diet gave him? You, these folks promoting this won't even be around when these diseases get. Um, but, uh, but boy, that steak tastes good in the mouth and I'm losing weight. And so that's what we focus on. And it's such a disservice uh, to the, to, certainly to our patients and, and the people uh, consuming that kind of diet. But it's a disservice to the animals, a service to the children, it's to this whole planet. This um, flesh-based diet is destroying our future. It's driving global warming. Uh, it's time to see the era of eating animals is over. We've used it up. We've used fishing up. It's time to let the oceans heal. We've used meat eating up. It's time to let the forest come back. And, and we, we could feed ourselves a plant-based diet requires so much less land and water. We could feed ourselves a healthy diet and let the planet heal. And we could talk about that. But, but uh, I agree with you. I, I got so frustrated um, that my colleagues were ignoring this that I, I left clinical practice. I'm just doing telemedicine now uh, to go around to the medical schools and talk to the medical students and say, listen, this is not these diseases are not unknown, etiology unknown, it's so much your patients are freaking eating. And, and, and before you order another $1,000 scan, another $500 set of lab tests, you ask them what they ate yesterday. And if it's full of burgers and buffalo wings and peaches, that's why they're sitting in front of you, doctor. Send them to the plant-based dietitian. Let her do the counseling. Let her take them shopping. Let her show them the videos. You see them back in a month and see if they're not healthier, which they will be. Uh, and that's how medicine should be practiced these days. Instead of just dragging them up to the OR and do a, a procedure on a, one artery, while the rest of their arteries are still rotting from every meal that they eat. So, uh, so it's quite a juggernaut that uh, we've got to we've got to undo here. And mm -hmm. uh, but it can be done. That's why I want to reach the young medical students before pharmacosclerosis sets into their brains. And they think that <laughs> drugs are the only treatment. Is that a new chronic disease? Yeah, I mean, um, made that one up, but it's, it's very like descriptive. It. Yeah, yeah, really, that's what we're dealing yeah. with. So maybe yeah. just a quick follow-up um, yeah. in your, and from what you see, since you do go to medical schools and, and, and try to talk to these young medical students, do you see um, a change in that? And as well, or maybe do you see that medical schools will start adding nutrition science as a criteria? Do you see oh that my. happening? That's quite a question. The students are very open to this yeah, because okay. thank heavens it's 2021. And in every first, second, third year class of medical students, there's 20, 30 students already who've seen movies like Forks Over Knives. They've mm -hmm. seen what the hell they've seen. Yeah. The light, they know what's going on more than yeah. their professors do. And, and it's that awareness that's uh, made them more open to, to what I'm describing to them, what I'm presenting. And, the, um, uh, and we've been going right to the students. We do an end run around administration. <laughs> we have the students who arrange the lecture hall. They send out the notices. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we go directly to the students. Uh, and they've been very, very receptive. Uh, the, uh, the professors come up to me afterwards and say, Doc, nice lecture, very important, we agree. 
but listen, the national boards don't ask questions about nutrition on their exams. And until they mm -hmm. do, we're not going to be teaching this stuff because you're, you're, they're not asking on the boards. So that's forced us to go to the National Board of Medical Examiners and say, would you please put some questions about applied nutrition and lifestyle medicine on the exams? And they're begrudgingly say, okay. Uh, and they w went to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and said, you make up a bunch of questions and give them to us and we'll start getting them into the exams. So slowly, slowly the wheels are turning, but at least they're starting to turn. Yes. So uh, long process, but we'll, we'll get there eventually. We, Definitely. We, uh, we want a, a generation of doctors who say, of course, they ask, what did you eat? You know, that's yeah. Every exactly. doctor should, yeah. should be asking those questions. So exactly. that's what we're trying to create. And a related uh, question um, about um, animal agriculture. Uh, some of my Facebook friends just uh, don't, don't seem to agree that um, animals cause the, the viruses. And I'd like to hear your feedback about that because it only makes sense to me that it comes from animals and look at how they're combined oh, oh, every, and everything. Oh, every single one of these. And, and it's an untenable argument knowing how we can disassemble the RNA and the DNA of every one of these viruses. And they are identical. The, the bats are filled with viruses. It's part of their ecology. Uh, and, and COVID is a recombined bat virus uh, combined with, apparently uh, with the uh, uh, pangolin, this lovely scale anteater uh, creature. Um, I think my desk oh. order. Um, the um, uh, the the apparently the bat droppings full of viruses were eaten by the pangolin, and then the pangolins got uh, they they combined to create this um, the, the the COVID virus. Uh, but every single one of these hellacious uh, viral diseases, from Ebola and Marburg and Lassa fever to measles to uh, uh, the, the mumps, uh, the pox viruses, the common cold, influenza, they're all animal viruses, every single one of them. Uh, when we push into the rainforest and we and the, uh, the hunting parties for the loggers have to bring back bush meat, so they shoot monkeys and they bring them back and they eat the monkey meat. Well, the monkey meat's full of monkey viruses and that's probably where Ebola came from and HIV came from. Uh, and, uh, and the uh, uh, and these poor animals that were uh, everything that from, again, from the bats to the pangolins to the turtles and all that in the wet markets are great petri dishes for, for viruses to, uh, to recombine and, uh, and, and come out as novel ones that we've never seen. But this is no time to cut tongues and wag fingers at those Asian, those evil bat-eating Asians. Well, no wonder because we're doing the same thing here exactly. in the West. Uh, our factory farms, when you coop in 100,000 chickens in a shed, 50,000 pigs in a, in a pig operation, these animals are sick. They're coughing on each other. They're trading viruses back and forth. And it's just a matter of time before and the next COVID kind of virus leaps out. Um, but it, but it will be far more lethal than COVID-19. It'll kill every third person or every other person that it contacts. And it's going to have made in America right, right across its chest because it's going to come out of an American factory farm. So we, we have no reason to feel superior to uh, the, the scene in Asia there. Um, uh, this is all this, this whole thing is the a Western Union telegram from the animals saying, stop already. We are not your food. Well, what are the humans, what is it going to take for you to understand this? And, and the, the bats and the pangolin reached out and they said, well, we're going to shut your economy down and we're going to take these guys right off the slaughterhouse line. And, they, and they're doing that. They're shutting down the slaughterhouses. The animals are finally saying enough. And, and that's the real message here. And if it's just a matter of, oh, let's come up with the next vaccine so we can get back to normal, they're missing the bigger picture here. It's exactly. trying to change what we are eating. The age of, of flesh production on this industrial scale is over. The age of industrial fishing is over. It's time to let the earth heal and the animals heal and our relations with, with them and let ourselves heal at the same time. So that's, that's the bigger picture. And there, there's not an issue. That, that, it, that it didn't come from, from some type of, of animal source. That, that this is not spontaneous uh, from, from within the human genome, that's for sure. I do agree with you. Um, I just wanted to hear your feedback so that the audience can hear it. Because uh, you know, I've been posting on Facebook that I believe it comes from animals as well. And I, I couldn't have said it better myself, but you know, you're absolutely right. 
Um, how do you um, expect this um, pandemic, the one we're currently in, how do you think it'll end? Oh my. Do you think um, it will be a vaccine or do you think uh, they're working on it. Yes, there'll be a vaccine, and um, and and we can. You know, it depends how you're feeling about, vac about vaccination. But I think people are going to be very desperate if it doesn't cause a lot of toxicity. I think people are going to welcome it. Um, and you know, the same way that we control measles uh, with, with vaccinations, uh, I'm sure somebody's going to come up with uh, with an antiviral agent like we have Tamiflu for, for the influenza virus. They'll they'll probably come up with an anti COVID virus. I know they're working like to come up with one of those, mm -hmm. and that would certainly change the game. Um, but this thing is a fierce virus. It's a strange one. The majority of people feel nothing or they just get a achy, fluey feeling for a couple of days and a cough and a fever and goes away. And 80, 90% of people, it's a mild infection. But the folks that it hits, um, oh, it's a nasty virus. This stuff makes your blood clot in your arteries. The, this 30% this, uh, of people wind up on dialysis, damages the kidneys. We're seeing strokes uh, from, from this disease uh, uh, in the susceptible people, or, or, but it's, we're seeing it sometimes in young people. Uh, it, this thing can be a killer, a nasty one, uh, and um, and it taxes the healthcare system. I, I saw a nurse on TV last night, an ICU nurse, saying, "You know, last month you saw all those hectic scenes in the in the ERs and the ICUs, people intubated on ventilators. Well, guess what? They're still here, those people, and they're still on the ventilators, and there's more coming in. This thing uh, puts yeah. you uh, on a ventilator for weeks and weeks. This is not the flu." Um, so you're asking, how is it going to end? Yeah, that, you know, depends how much immunity we get from having the virus. Uh, a bunch of healthy young people are getting infected and they're winding up with antibodies. Does that protect them from a, from a reinfection? We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully there'll be a, a, the number of in, uh, immune people will, will increase. And that plus the vaccination will probably turn it into the measles, which will be kind of a background viral infection that will haunt you if you let your guard down, but shouldn't stop our lives like, like, like it's doing currently now. Yeah, but it's a fine kettle of tofu we got ourselves in here. That's, yeah. that's for sure. That's yeah, this is, this is we, we couldn't hear the animals and now they're, they're yelling at us. And yeah. Now maybe mm -hmm. we'll hear Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I have a quick question really quick. We have um, still sure. some time. Yeah. So it, it seems like I mean, I, I felt I was very fortunate to hear this information at the right time, you know, with all the forces in the world and all the misinformation I've heard over my my life. Um, I happen just to be in a good environment and a good presentation and just really hear it. And it just spoke to me. Um, some people might kind of hear it and they kind of want to do it. They're on the fence. They have that ambivalence and just might seem really overwhelmed. Um, maybe they don't have a doctor that seems to be on board with this. They don't have family members that are on board with this. What could you, what could they do to, to hope to maybe just kind of start to see how it is? Um, do you see patients like, could someone just set up a one-on-one -on -one face uh, a meeting with you? Um, maybe just kind of speak to those people a little bit. Like how can someone who's, kind of on the fence, wants to do it, just doesn't know how to get started. Um, oh, such an do? important question. Oh, thank you, Terry. That's a great question. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would suggest that people just putting their toes in the water, go to a website uh, called Forks Over Knives and, uh, and see the film by that name on that website. Mm -hmm. uh, the fork is your dinner fork. The knife is a scalpel <laughs> going down your sternum there. You want to take the fork over the knife, let me tell you. Yes, I agree. Um, and so see the film. You'll get it. You'll see people getting healthy, eating a whole food plant-based diet, and then go back to the website. They've got recipes and transition plans and coaches and people who can help you make this transition. So check out ForksOverKnives.com. Go to this website uh, called PCRM.com, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM.org. Uh, I'm sorry, PCRM.org. Uh, and they've got a 21-day jump start. They've got recipes. They've got coaches. They can help you. You'll find all the information. And for professional colleagues watching this, uh, click on Clinicians. Uh, at the PCRM website. And there's plenty of CME and information about the, the, the scientific aspect of plant-based diets. So these are two good places to start. Or, uh, cruise around those websites. Go to my website, drclamper.com. I've got meal plans there as well. Um, so uh, there's plenty of information around. If you need a coach, you need someone to help you, absolutely. I'll be glad to do this. Uh, 
I'm joining a company called Plant-Based Telehealth. Uh, we do uh, 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 plant-based uh, consultations. Uh, it's around. Uh, so, you know, start with start going to my website, uh, drclapper.com. Uh, but there's lots of uh, just type in plant-based dietitians and see who's in your area. Mm -hmm. And there, there's lots of registered dietitians who are now plant-based, and she can or he can coach you uh, on what you need mm -hmm. to do. So seek and you shall find, and it's easy finding. Just, just seek mm -hmm. that much, and, and it's easy to find. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also have a question. Um, what What is it about um, the psychology of people who are able to make the change? Like for myself, um, you know, I, it still amazes me. I was able to make such a shift from um, the American uh, standard American diet. Uh, you know, so many people opt for uh, medication, and um, for me, I didn't want that. I'm just wondering. Uh, do you have any thoughts on? Um, why some people are able to make the change over others. Um, just what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, um, it's when we look at people who relapse, who go back to their previous uh, animal-based diet, um, the vast majority are social reasons. The, they didn't want to deal with the comments from their family. They uh, didn't want to be the odd man out at the restaurant. Uh, they, 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 they just they didn't feel socially comfortable. Uh, and to those folks, um, I can say, listen, it's, it's 2020 now. Um, the, the world is moving towards plant-based uh, nutrition. Every meal, every restaurant has a plant-based section uh, of entrees that you can choose from. And, you know, if you're an adult man or woman, you know, the heck with what the peanut gallery is saying. You know, I say, listen, God forbid you get a heart attack or a stroke or a cancer. It's only you in that hospital. It's not the, the people at work, it's not your spouse, it's not your daughter-in-law, it's you. And we're talking about you taking your own life in your own hands and doing what you need to do. So start modest, just start for just a, a plant-based breakfast, just do that. Or learn, you know, make up a big pot of vegetable soup and have a salad and a big bowl of soup and uh, some, some rice or beans and, and that's a meal. And just, just do that for lunch or just that for dinner. You know, just get comfortable in small steps. It's not a huge sacrifice. It's, it's ordering the, the bean chili instead of the beef chili. You know, it's not that big a joke uh, that we're talking about to have the vegetable stir fry instead of the chicken stir fry. You know, just leave out the chicken, make the same vegetable stir fry. It, it's, it's not that a huge a sacrifice. Uh, and the food tastes great. You can do it in any cuisine, Italian, Chinese, East Indian, Mexican. Um, they're, they're, you're not gonna miss anything as far as, uh, uh, as, far as taste goes. So, uh, so make the step. Your, your body's never not looking. The, you know, it, Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. Dr. Clamper said, thine own health be true. Thine own arteries be true. Thine own colon be true. Yeah, thine own life be true. Uh, and just so, so take it in as big a step or as small a step as you need. Um, the people who live on their own really have it easiest all. You don't have to answer to anybody. I just, mm -hmm. just do it. And uh, clean out the fridge, get rid of the oil and the dairy and the eggs and the, all that stuff, load it up with all the rice and beans and greens and fruits uh, that you, you need to make these wonderful dishes and get on with it already. You know, it, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a sacrifice. And as Terry said, the, the change you feel is just remarkable. Mm -hmm. Your whole body responds. Suddenly you've got energy, your life, yeah. your bowels are working, your lungs are squeezing, the headaches go away. You turn into a healthy human being again. What, what more can you want? Mm -hmm. um, in my slideshow to the students, I say, you know, you want to heal these patients or don't you? You want to heal them and get real about what, what they're eating. And, and you watch this uh, wonderful transformation happen. I'm the happiest doctor I know. My patients get healthy. <laughs> I <laughs> love that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, that's the invitation. And so it's mm -hmm. not you're on the edge of the pool. Should I jump in? Should I, oh, jump in already. Boots exactly. in. Just do it. And the rewards are, are bounteous and it's delicious. Yeah, it must feel very uh, gratifying, right, to uh, see a patient um, improve from, from oh. uh, like heart disease or whatever they have. Oh, it's a miracle. These are diseases I was told will never go away. Once you're diabetic, you'll always be diabetic. Mm -hmm. That's it. That'd be, that'd be diabetes goes away. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. you have high blood pressure, you'll take these pills the rest of your life. Nonsense. We have people off their blood pressure pills all the time. In fact, you not only can get them off, you have to get them off. Yeah. They get lean and healthy, their blood pressure will drop mm -hmm. to their boots if you don't get them off these pills. So uh, it's, it's the whole concept of disease reversal, 
What a wonderful, magical concept. I practiced medicine 47 years before anybody put those two words in the same sentence for me. These are reversible diseases. They're preventable too, uh, and especially to young people. Man, just eat plant foods and you're gonna stay lean, healthy, and out of the clutches of people like me. And that, that's really what you wanna do. <laughs> Well, you're That's making right. it so much fun to, to sit with someone like you. Yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. I don't, recommend, I don't recommend anybody getting a chronic disease just so they can sit with No, no. The easier <laughs> ways to get in contact with <laughs> Just go to my website instead. That's much easier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, those were most of all my questions. If uh, Okay. Uh, Richard, do you have any more? Yeah, I just have um, yeah. another question. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts uh, about protein powders? Um, I'm very careful about ingredients and I, I try to avoid them, but uh, uh, even plant-based protein powders, what are your thoughts on them? Yeah, there's no real need for, there's rare uses for them. Uh, I'm very concerned. Um, uh, from what I read, there's been a couple of studies to the contrary, but by and large, high protein diets are, are toxic to the kidneys. Uh, when, when you blast a, a whole bunch of amino acids into the kidneys, you know, again, we're the human body, we're used to getting our amino acids bound up in plant fiber, you know, in the fiber of the beans and the, and the lentils. And, and it takes hours for those proteins to get digested and the amount of protein rises very gradually in the blood, doesn't exert much of effect. But boy, you put 100 grams of protein powder, you know, two, three tablespoons of that stuff into a smoothie and bolt it down. Uh, suddenly, boom, uh, all those amino acids slam into the kidney filters. And there's a, a study showing that, that that makes the kidney shift into a gear called hyperfiltration, and it's stressful on the kidneys. Um, when, the, when the kidney doctors and the nephrologists have someone going into kidney failure, the first thing they do is put them on the low protein diet because high protein diets are, are toxic to the kidneys. So protein, 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 we're all, you know, where are you gonna get your protein, you vegan? Uh, the truth is there's protein in all plant foods. And these concentrated proteins, I'm, I'm concerned about in these powders uh, because of the effect on the kidneys, and also um, your liver, uh, you blast with a bunch of amino acids, it's going to respond with a, um, with a gush of this hormone called insulin-like growth factor 1, IGF-1, uh, which makes the body build tissue, which is great if you're a young growing boy or girl. But if you're an adult, a guy with a big prostate or a prostate cancer, the last thing you want is your liver putting out a bunch of IGF-1 that stimulates growth. If you're a woman with a breast lump, that's the last thing you want to be doing is, is putting out lots of IGF-1. Um, more is not better here when it comes to right. protein. So get your protein out of whole plant foods. Uh, and if you're eating enough calories, if you're eating your 2,000 calories to keep your weight on, uh, out of whole plant foods, whole grains, beans, the fruits, vegetables, you are guaranteed of getting 50, 60, 70 grams of high grade protein. It, it's in the plants, it's in the greens, it's in the beans, it's in the nuts and seeds. Uh, you can't miss, it's not an issue. In 47 years of practice, I've never written the diagnosis protein deficiency on, on right. a chart. <laughs> right. it, that, that's not the, the issue. But protein excess, I get concerned. I think a lot of these cancers are driven by protein excess. I think some of the kidney failure is driven by it. Uh, and we, we just don't need these protein powders. That said, there are some medical conditions, people with muscle wasting diseases, et cetera, there may be a use for them. And uh, even the bodybuilders, even uh, Robert Cheek and some of the vegan bodybuilders are back, they used to do lots of these protein powders. Yeah, I think you moved away from it. They're, yeah. they're starting to move away from it because again, this is not sugar or candy here. This is, uh, well, that's bad enough as it is, sugar or candy. But these protein powders uh, are, 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 can be problematic. So I'm not a big fan of them by and large. Right. I'd rather you have another scoop of lentil stew or another bean burrito. Uh, rather than using uh, protein powders. Yeah, because you see so many ads, um, you know, everywhere. Protein this, this is protein rich, and it just you know, you know, drives me crazy. Plenty yeah. of protein. You know, yeah. all the, the food's full of it. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. That's all the questions I had as well. And um, I wanted to thank you for your time because uh, oh, your, um, the movie, um, What the Health, mm -hmm. had a big impact on me. That was uh, one of the movies that helped me make the transition to 100% plant-based. And I know you're in that. And um, yeah, I thank you for, uh, oh, oh, for all absolutely. your work that you've done. 
and I want to commend both of you. Uh, you know, the science is solid. We get it. Uh, whole, whole food, plant-based <laughs> diets make you lean and healthy and make diseases go away. We don't need enough studies to say that. What we need now is education of the public. We need to get this out into the, the common mm -hmm. thought that it's okay to nourish your body on whole plant foods. It's the way right. to... To, to physical health, it's the way to, to ecological stability, the, the forests will come back. We, we need so much less land to, to grow plant-based um, food for everyone that you can feed 14 people on the land it takes now to grow, to feed one person on an animal-based diet. You can feed 14 plant eaters on that. Well, that would let the forest come back and the water fund yep. clear and the soil stabilize. It would, um, and as the trees grow, they take carbon dioxide out of the air. It would reverse global warming. A plant-based diet is our key to the future. We need to make to move it from that strange things the vegans do to just what you eat, you know, right. and, and what human beings should have been eating and what we need to eat now. And so mm -hmm. programs like this, podcasts like this, are so important for helping educate uh, our, to take our brothers and sisters by the hand and lead them to a healthier way to eat. And, and you folks are normalizing it and promulgating this. It's so beautiful a service you're doing that uh, it's my honor to uh, participate and, and help get this word out. So thank you for the invitation, for the good work you're doing. Yeah, keep it up. We need it. Definitely. <laughs> and thank you again. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Clapper. You're so welcome. Good luck with your, with your baby. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. He's already, okay. he's already plant strong. So. <laughs> All right. That's the best gift you could give him. And yeah, uh, even, yeah. even Jordy thinks so too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take care. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.